Welcome. My name is Rhiannon Moran. On behalf of RACP and the New South Wales and ACT Regional Committee, we would like to welcome you to this evening's event, Robo Doctors, the Rise of Artificial Intelligence and Technology in Medicine. What an incredible turnout this evening. A big welcome to everyone in the room and to those dialing in from across Australia and New Zealand, as well as those overseas. Um, I believe we have some people from Hong Kong and in Germany. So a big welcome to everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. To housekeeping, in case of emergency, the fire stairs are located outside the sliding doors to the right. <coughs> The toilets are down the corridor to the left. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ron Grenot. Dr. Ron Grenot is a neurologist at East Neurology and a clinical advisor at HealthShare Digital. Dr. Ron Grenot is also a member of the New South Wales and ACT Regional Committee. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, uh, my name is Ron, and as you can see, uh, I'm joined today by Mr. Scolay, Mr. Fiss, and Professor Carrera, and all of them will be presenting before. But first, I just wanted to talk uh, and share my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, share my thoughts about the future of AI. Uh, <laughs> I'm still left with legacy technology until then. <laughs> um, so basically, just to try and put this evening into context, I thought I'd raise a few of the major sort of global health issues that, that we're all facing. Um, an ageing population uh, in, in developed nations, this, this is already approaching 25% of over 65. And we're all living longer with their associated higher healthcare costs. As we all know, there's an increasing mental health burden with anxiety and depression becoming more and more prevalent. Um, low birth, birth rates, which further exacerbates that, that skewed population. And uh, in all, not enough clinicians, particularly in primary care. And we've also got increasing, sorry, thank you. And we've also got the burden of increasing burnout in our, in our stress clinicians. So what sort of solutions are needed? And these are some of the solutions that uh, uh, experts in this space have been proposing, including a universal health record, um, more doctors, but also for less money. In other words, trying to optimise medical efficiency, uh, greater involvement of the patient in their own care, and the concept of value-centred care. And in all of this, in this mix, there's a, been a lot of, a lot of uh, excitement and, and fuss about AI. There's actually a, a journal which I found recently called Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. Um, there have been lots of books written and co conceptually a lot of thoughts about uh, doctors and becoming more and more artificial intelligence powered. So I thought we'd, we'd start by sort of uh, discussing where does AI fit into this? Well, there are kind of a couple of areas. One is trying to wade through the big data component to turn all that data into insights and analysis, but also as an, a driver of efficiency of doctors. In other words, uh, we use the doctor's time more and more effectively to do what doctors do best, which might also be changing, which I'll get to later. So I thought, uh, before we start, just to sort of very briefly discuss what, what AI actually is. So, to, to try and bring it down to its most uh, minimal sort of uh, existence, it's essentially taking digital data, running it through an algorithm by having it compared to output measures. And that's how the algorithm is trained. Um, and then that, that algorithm is applied to new data and predicts outcome measures. And that, that is at its core simplicity what it's about. So an example, an example in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, learning a data set about uh, identifying objects in photos. There's an untrained neural network um, on the far left there. And then through a training data set, the neural network 
changes uh, each layer of abstraction to identify an object and eventually learn that this is a cat, not a dog. That train model is then applied to new data and then it can correctly identify the data as a cat, which you can say that's very good and Google image search will do that for you. But how does that apply to medicine? Well, a couple of issues are there. We as doctors learn from cases, single patients, and, and uh, machine learning isn't like that. Machine learning generally needs very large data sets to be able to train its algorithm. And the learning is very specific. In other words, the data set needs to be representative, uniform, and complete, because the data is, is the, the uh, artificial intelligence system is using all those factors to make its decisions. So if the data set's incomplete, it may miss uh, important factors that it sees. And so with that, where, where artificial intelligence is most likely and, and is becoming more and more involved in clinical medicine these days, because of its reliance on complete data being representative in large training data sets, is in these areas, basically radiology, where they take digitized images and reports for training output, and a topical pathology where new uh, slime digitizers have been recently FDA approved as well. So they can uh, train the algorithm with the, with the human report plus the digital slides as a complete data set. And also in dermatology and ophthalmology where skin and eye lesions are photographed and, and diagnoses are trained on that. And there are still, and there are obviously some advantages for us as you can see, you know, humans can sit back and relax and there'll, there'll be issues, medical legal issues that will come up with this over a, an extensive period of time, I suspect. But the, the issue with radiology, for example, from a, a workflow perspective is that the number of images and the imaging modalities grow extremely rapidly, whereas the number of radiologists does not. And so this is, this is, uh, where artificial intelligence can come in and fill a real problem in, in care provision. So in radiology, um, if you look through, basically the, the bottom slide kind of introduces the concepts where each layer of the neural network is identifying different aspects of the image and, and therefore learning and, and making decisions on what things are and, and uh, classifying on the basis of the information that the previous layer inputs to it. And that's how uh, the human uh, brain also works. It's, it's very similar in that sense that uh, there are certain parts of the human cortex that identify certain aspects of an image, for example, edges, and these move on to become higher and higher layer of, layers of abstraction, which is why these are called neural, neural networks. Um, I'll also point out, um, you can see there that it talks about hidden layers and one of the one of the issues that I'll, I'll raise again a bit later is these, these uh, neural networks don't actually explain, like a doctor can, what they're using to make their decision based on. So they, they tend to be described as black boxes of decision making. And so what, what the current technology and the, the latest stages of AI development is to try and have more explicable AI where the, the factors that the machine is making to decide on each area are explained to as part of the output. So in, in image-based tasks, for example, they can define boundaries of the lesion, they can help diagnose lesions, they can stage, for example, in, in uh, cancer diagnosis on, on imaging, they can <coughs> stage lesions as well. And, th and then long-term, the lesion can be monitored and, and uh, the temporal progression uh, can be uh, also discerned. And I thought I'd run through a variety of different current FDA approved solutions that are in practice at the moment, just to give you a taste of the sort of technologies that are already coming, uh, that are already out and in practice. Not coming, not wouldn't be, wouldn't it be nice, but these are things that are already in practice. So there is viz.ai, I suspect a lot of these will be using that .ai domain. Um, these scan CT images for indicators associated with stroke and then can automatically contact the specialist directly through the system if it identifies potential large vessel blockage, in other words, with a view to neurointervention. So this is a system that's, that's uh, 
from from ED to uh, triage and and contacting a consultant all automated. There's Accipio IX, which receives uh, images of non-contrast CTs for patients who have uh, presented again through emergency and again through an AI algorithm can identify high-risk patients who've had a hemorrhage and again notify appropriate uh, clinicians as well as uh, as well as uh, point out uh, to the treating doctor and the radiologist who's reporting. And then some simpler ones but very common. Uh, another image in osteo detect, detects Collie's fractures, so wrist, fa wrist fractures. Again, uh, notifying the clinician and making their workload easier. And there are more. Uh, cardiologists now have echocardiograms that are processed through AI networks and the optimal image is selected to, to give the, the best representation of the ejection fracture, fractions. Zebra Medical Vision uh, currently uh, analyzes coronary CT angiograms to give the, the calcium score. And our terrace um, has also developed a, an algorithmic uh, look at CT scans to detect cancer. And then to move on to pathology and dermatology, you'll see that the, the concepts are, are getting more and more familiar. These are all just images of retina, uh, retinal photographs that are, have been analyzed and, and these are able to detect diabetic retinopathy in adults. Um, and then the image and the report are printed out uh, for the treating clinician. So again, you can imagine that all, all one needs now are these retinal photographs and, and uh, the AI does, does the rest. So there, there's a huge scope for much more efficient and perhaps more intensive monitoring of diabetic patients. And finally, just into the, the dermatology, into the uh, histopathology, uh, page AI has been trialled and been found to be more effective than experienced dermatologists in melanoma detection. And uh, it, it's more sensitive, misdiagnosed, few benign moles, and therefore more specific as well. And now they're, they're applying the same technology to uh, looking at histopathology of, of, uh, of uh, prostate cancer as well. So all of these areas are evolving, evolving rapidly. The FDA is approving a lot of technologies and they're here now and more and more are coming. And then finally, which, which is a slightly more interesting and, and more uh, nuanced, perhaps uh, threatening, uh, place where AI is going to enter our lives is uh, in advising therapeutics. So Watson, Watson uh, which is IBM's uh, AI division, uh, began to suggest by having certain inputs from clinicians, which would be the optimal chemotherapy for certain cancer patients. Um, this has been a lot more controversial in terms of its effectiveness. But again, to give you a taste of what, what's coming, what's in and around these uh, AI in these fields. And then just to, to give you a slightly different take on big data, there's an FDA approved asthma polis, which is using these new devices, which are GPS enabled puffers, to look at both micro trends, they can monitor how frequently the puffers are used and, and judge how well or otherwise an individual's patient <coughs> asthma is asthma is, but also macro trends. If there's a collection of patients with increasing acute use of asthma puffers in a certain geographic location, now they can alert clinicians and health authorities to suggest that there might be something worth investigating. So again, this is where big data and AI can be used to, to generate more, more trends than we currently have. To, to get more into the, the patient consultation, there is an interface problem. Um, we need to still ask patients, apart from uh, when we image them, we need to ask them about what's, what's actually wrong. And there's still been a problem with completeness, the uniformity, the representativeness of the training samples, which is why AI is still not quite in the patient consultation. Um, and doctors aren't necessarily the most comprehensive in our record taking either, which makes it more difficult to interpret <coughs> records. Um, and, and we feel more comfortable also, and, and I've read numerous articles where they felt that AI won't be intervening in the, in the patient consultation because ultimately there are nonverbal cues and, and humans uh, can interpret those when we're not busy typing. Um, but machines are learning. Um, and 
I just wanted to show one more brief slide. So this is uh, this was a training sample of a machine learning algorithm to recognize human expression. And they ran it through feature extraction and predicted which of these emotions the, uh, the data set uh, is showing. And when they were then uh, exposed to a new data set that they hadn't been trained on, uh, accuracies were in the 80% mark or so. So again, what we feel is an entirely and intrinsically human trait mm -hmm. is being taught to AI. And so we can't necessarily rest on our, our human laurels as well. So I thought I'd, I'd take a little step and I won't, I won't tread on our, our uh, coming speakers uh, area too much, but if we have a comprehensive interoperable universal health record with a voice interface, with comprehensive history taking, integration of investigations, therapeutics, and the, the human emotional side of it, we can see that there, there is potential scope for a lot of involvement of AI in our future consultations. Um, and I think we're right at that cusp at the moment where narrow task specific AI is now coming online and is helping to improve doctor efficiency and effectiveness. <clears throat> But the question comes in the future, and our, our next speakers will talk about this in more detail, of where that future goes, where, where more complex tasks are able to be, uh, are able to be uh, performed by AI. And I thought I'd take a couple of quotes from uh, Professor of Health Systems and the Innovation Lab at Washington University, that we may become, rather than data collectors analyzers, more in counseling for our patients. And another, another interesting thought was that maybe we wouldn't have any more scheduled follow-ups and simply doctors will review all the AI analyzed data streams coming from thousands of their patients and, <laughs> and, uh, and the picture of each patient's health will be simply delivered into the doctor's care. And if there's a problem, and only then patients can be called in to be reviewed <coughs> physically. Um, and it's that sort of ability to sort through massive amounts of data and then present them in a much more uh, specific dichotomized diagnostic categories that may well mean that we eliminate care the patients don't need and we target the patients who do. So thanks for listening. And uh, we'll move on to James now. James is the CEO of Genius Solutions, a company that's been providing practice management practice management solutions to the Australian medical industry for over 20 years. So, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a great presentation. Really, really exciting to look out for the future and see what AI is going to bring to the world and to this, this industry. So, it's, it's my pleasure to be here this evening. I think this is a, a great event and I really, really um, congratulate the RACP for putting this workshop in front of you. Um, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking to you about the future of the medical record and specifically the, the future of the electronic medical record, the only medical record that really does have a future. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk to you about three things. Uh, first of all, about the electronic medical record today and why today's situation really is a burning platform for change. I'm going to share some insights from a, a recent uh, survey that we did. Uh, I think it's the largest and <coughs> this type in, in Australia, and really looking at the at specialists' perspectives on, on technology uh, in and around their, their EMR systems. And then we'll have a look to the future, and I'm going to share with you five things that I think are going to happen in terms of EMR in the next five years, and why those five things, assuming I'm, I'm right and they do happen, mean that your electronic medical record has a very, very bright future indeed. Before we get into that, um, just for, for full disclosure, I wanted to give you a bit of context because I have to admit I come to this conversation with a, some pretty specific bias and Jeff definitely a, a vested interest in, in the outcome. So for full disclosure, you know, GD, GD Solutions uh, um, is, is providing practice management solutions, as, as we said, for, for over 20 years. And so our perspective is around the practice electronic medical record rather than practice EMRs. I think the trends are similar, the issues are similar, but you know, just to, to be clear, that's where our perspective is coming from. You know, we're also going through a transition from a family business to um, private equity ownership uh, through our, our, our private equity partner, IFM, and 
Now, the underlying investor is actually uh, HESTA, the Health Industry Super Fund. So and they're investing a lot of money um, in helping us build a, <coughs> allowing us to build a cloud platform and it'll become relevant why that's important to give you that confidence. Um, but they have a, you know, obviously they want to get a return for their members, some of which will be in the room. But they're also very interested in, and strategically interested in how we can make the new system better. So we're aligned in our commitment to helping medical professionals you know, really deliver better health outcomes. So with that context, and, and um, as you'll see, a vested interest in the outcomes here, you know, let's talk about the issues um, that, we, that we see around electronic medical records today. I've spent the last 25 years or so running technology businesses and, and relatively new to the health industry. And when I came into this industry, I was pretty surprised um, by the state of technology in, in a few areas. And the first issue I saw is best described with this slide. So this is actually a slide that I, I borrowed with permission from one of our clients uh, who runs a, a big practice here, very tech savvy, you know, really you know, efficiency sort of practice. And this is his this is his technology solution that, um, map that he has in place. So GE's at the centre of this, and there's multiple solutions. And you can see like it's a bit of a mess. And you know, three years ago it was a bit of a mess. And you know there's all these different solutions that are not really connected together. And I have to tell you, you know, when I was going through this with the client, he, you know, he was complaining to me about about the situation, saying this is what it was like three years ago. And then his next slide was, you know, this is what it's like today. <laughs> and the, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice no change whatsoever. And, and that's true, you know, that, that's the situation we're, we're living in today from an electronic <coughs> medical record point of view. And our, 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 our healthcare IT system, is, as an ecosystem, is very disconnected. And there's just, you know, from a technologist's point of view, there's just no reason for that today. You, know, you, look, at, you look at other industries, you look at um, other you know, really complex industries, highly regulated industries, <coughs> And these, these issues, the issue of connecting an ecosystem is well and truly solved. So, you know, this, this is a problem. I'd go so far to say it's a, it's a crime scene in some cases. Some cases, literally a crime scene. There's, there's people um, dying because of this. There's people um, losing money because of this. And it's definitely affecting health outcomes. The, the second issue is one that's you know, very dear to my heart, and that is um, what we call UX, user experience. And, something you know, we software guys really obsess about. Um, just, just to kind of demonstrate what UX is all about, I, I want to show you a couple of examples of bad user experience or, or UX. So, so you can see here, this is what happens when you, when you get user experience wrong and you don't really you know, think it through. Um, and the reality is obviously this is a, you know, a car park and a tea, teapot and a, and a lift and um, very different examples from our world but the reality is, in healthcare IT, you know, UX is, is, is a train wreck, and it really is. It, it, it's shocking. You know, the, the systems that we're using from a technology point of view just haven't taken that user experience in, into account. Um, and and you know, that means they're not being adopted, that means they're not being um, optimised, and that means that, you know, that your practices, that means the medical system is not nearly as efficient as it, as it should be. So UX seems like a small thing, but you know, my point of view is it's a it's a major thing, and it's a major problem holding back use of technology in in this industry. The final thing is is the the, the final big problem is that we have a very fragmented local IT market. So you might be surprised to know that for those of you that you know, have have your own medical practices, there's 270 different healthcare IT providers wanting to sell products to you. Most of those companies are subscale, you know, they're very small, and they are solving a small part of the problem, and you know, frankly, poorly. Not all of them. There's some amazing companies in this industry doing an amazing job, but you know, broad generalisation compared to other industries, you know, these really are providers of offering these services really are subscale and, and not doing the job they could do. That crowded market is is stifling innovation. <coughs> So you know, it's, it's very difficult for you to look at amongst those 270 providers and figure out which ones are actually good and can make a difference for your practice. And it's very difficult for those good innovative products to cut through that crowd and get to you and, and really prove their worth. So really stifling in innovation. And, and, and our view is the heart of that is a lack of strategic investment 
and, and the local market. <coughs> so three big issues um, that face the face the your electronic medical records day. And you know, my, my point is it's a really is a burning burning platform for change. So let's dive inside um, the, the research that we've recently done. Um, so we went out to our, our customer base, we've got um, 4,000 practices and many thousands of, of practitioners and their staff using our systems. And you know, we, when we're working with our, our research partner, they said normally for this kind of research, you expect a 4% response rate. They said, you know, for medical specialists, are really busy, it's going to be tough to get them to respond, they've got way better things to do than answering your questionnaire, you might get one or two percent response. So we were pretty surprised to get actually close to 10 percent response. And what that says to me is that um, you know, the, the, the specialists in Australia are you know, truly engaged with technology and truly engaged with the future of their electronic They really see it as an important business tool. Um, you know, pretty interesting to see that, you know, we knew that there was a agenda um, imbalance amongst medical specialists. But pretty interesting to see those figures come through amongst such a broad sample set. So 69% you know, of medical practitioners male, 27% female. <coughs> Somebody said, somebody's talking before about the age, the, age, the demographics are for, uh, here, and it's interesting to see the, the age spread. And we, we certainly see a correlation between the younger specialists coming through and more, more females coming through, which is, which is great to see. Um, we obviously asked about the, uh, their, their perceptions of, of AI, and because we think that you know, looking forward, AI is going to have a profound impact on, on all of us in, in this industry. And we're, we're really excited to see that 30% um, of, nearly a third of all respondents had a, had a net positive view about, about AI. Frankly, that was, that was higher than what we thought. Um, but the real issue for us was that you know, nearly 70%, nearly so 65% had um, either didn't know or, or didn't have a positive view. Um, so that says to us you know, that we really need to be engaging in these kind of conversations and really educating because this, this is going to have a, a profound impact on all of us, whether we like it or not. The more we have an opinion, the more we can know, the more that we can shape the future when it comes to AI. So you know, again, congratulations to the RACP on you know, really engaging you all in this, in this conversation tonight. It's a, it's a very important one. We also asked about the cloud. You know, we're investing millions of dollars in the cloud. Um, most other industries have materially moved to the cloud. Um, this industry has not. And so we asked um, medical practices, you know, what are your intentions about moving to the cloud? And 40% uh, have said, told us that they want to move to the cloud inside the next two years if there's a, the right product available. So, you know, huge demand for the cloud, for the cloud moving forward. We asked them what they liked about the cloud and what they were worried about. And, and this is pretty interesting. You know, the, the benefits of the cloud, the kind of things like being able to access software from different locations, um, uh, to operate on any platform are kind of the, the obvious or, or hygiene benefits of moving to the cloud. And the real killer benefits, the things that are going to knock people's socks off, uh, aren't coming through there. So that, for us, means that you know, once, once the benefits of cloud is really, are really demonstrated in this industry, there'll be even more demand for that, for that shift. Conversely, on the concerns, concerns around security, internet speed, the ability to migrate data, now, these things are, 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 are reasonable concerns, but the great news is they are concerns of perception, not reality. Now, these technology has, cloud technology, has largely solved these issues. So it's a matter of education, it's a matter of, of, of understanding rather than the reality of technology today. Well, we're also interesting to look at what software practices are using. So, you know, we asked what software have you used in the, in the last month? And, you know, some obvious results there. What was probably more surprising to us was the, what, what software, you know, by implication, people aren't using. So, you know, wow, 52% using secure messaging. So that's, you know, that's nearly half the market, not even trying to use secure messaging, using fax machines, using snail mail, um, using, using very, very old and inefficient technology. Business tools like accounting software, stuff that's really going to drive, if, drive um, business that's not being used as, as much as we think. Also, you know, great news is, is the, the future requirements. So what software are people looking to implement in the next one to two years? 
So many practices are looking to invest in technology, they're looking to invest substantially, and look, looking at investing in online questionnaires, online appointment bookings. So stuff that really is gonna make a difference to their patients, make a difference to their patient experience and their practice efficiency. So really, really encouraging view for the future. Um, so speaking of the future, you know, I, I would say that we've got a very change. You know, our research says that there's a real interest in technology, real, real willingness to embrace it amongst, amongst you and your colleagues. And that there's five things that are going to happen to the electronic medical record in the next five years. So we're not talking miles out, we're talking near and clear opportunities that really do mean the electronic medical record has a, has a very bright future. The first one is, you know, the future is definitely the cloud. And we believe that medical practices uh, in whole will move to the cloud over the next decade and materially in the next five years. This gives suppliers like us and you know, vendors the opportunity to completely reimagine mm -hmm. What, a, what, a, what an EMR solution could be and deliver amazing user experience. You know, modern cloud technology just allows us to change the game in terms of the value of delivering, delivering the customer. And you removes the need for IT infrastructure. You're, you're, in, the business of, you're in the business of um, practicing medicine and you're not in the business of running a IT systems and you know, hugely frustrating, hugely complex to run those internally. The cloud gets rid of all of that for you. You know, but part of this is going to be, is driven by by the huge growth we're seeing from cloud infrastructure suppliers. So Amazon Web Services is the market leader, closely followed by Microsoft and Google. These companies are spending billions of dollars and really revolutionising the way IT is delivered really revolutionising the way software is developed um, at all. So this means that when you, when you move to the cloud with, um, with those kind of providers or software built on those kind of providers, you're getting as, as part of that package absolutely the best possible infrastructure, absolutely the best possible security and, and patching management. And you're removing all of, those, all of those headaches. You don't have to worry about integrations anymore. You don't have to worry about the uptime, et cetera, that's, that's all taken care of. So revolutionise the way the way software is deployed in, in this industry. Also, ease of integration. A lot of talk about interoperability in, in our industry and the disconnected ecosystem. The cloud means that interoperability will be realised, and we'll be able to you'll be able to get much more complete solutions through that interoperability. So you know, not solutions instead of one our customer's slide that we started with, you know, nicely knitted together. Um, Solution that's really, really integrated. And you know, finally, huge investment. You know, we're spending millions, others are spending millions, millions of dollars. So when, you, when, you, when people are moving to the cloud, they're getting the benefit of, of really significant investment. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. The, the second thing is, you know, as we move to the cloud, that means that the electronic medical record is going to reach out of the outside of the practice. It's going to engage your patients and it's going to automate that patient journey. It's going to automate the way patients find a doctor, find you. It's going to automate the way they book an appointment to come and, come and see you. It's going to automate the pre-treatment workflow, how you get the information and things that you need to do um, before, before treatment. It's going to help in the treatment itself, help deliver content, etc. And it's really going to help when it comes to post-treatment, to follow up, to collecting problems and, and prems. And this is going to have a, a profound impact on, on, on outcomes, and it's going to have a pr profound impact on the efficiency of your, of your practice. So that's the second thing. And you know, really, as the, um, as the patient starts to get engaged in the same technology as you're using, so today it's just you, it doesn't touch the patient. As the patient starts to get in, in, involved in the very same technology, we're going to see the emergence of platforms of, of true scale. So that fragmented issue we talked about before, and in, in, in many other industries, we've seen the emergence of, as, as, um, as people move to the cloud, as technology moves to the cloud, as the two sides of the problem start engaging in the same technology, you think Uber, think Salesforce, think Airbnb, you've seen these platforms of scale emerge. And we're gonna see the same in the next, in the next <coughs> few years in, in the electronic medical record industry. 
That means serious technology investment. Now, building these platforms does not come cheap. It's going to, there's going to be a huge amount of investment going into technology. You're going to be a beneficiary of that investment. You're going to be able to leverage you know, cutting edge technology um, at a slice of the price. You know, your, 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 your little part of that, a little part of that platform getting really, really great cutting edge technology. It's going to be market consolidation. So there's not going to be two, 270 players. When I stand here and talk to you in, in five years' time, you're going to consolidate significantly. But slightly paradoxically, that consolidation is actually going to drive true innovation. So you know, as we see less, less providers there, as these platforms come, come, um, come to real scale, you're going to, they're going to help you make the right decisions about the right products you should be using. They're going to help you understand which ones are great, which ones aren't. You can use reviews and stuff that really help you connect to those. So the, the great products are going to be much more easily available to you. The, the other thing is, is that the, the dynamics of the platform world are going to accelerate change you know, and, and really accelerate change. We've seen slow adoption of technology in this industry, slower than it should be. Platforms have the power to change that. You've seen that with other platforms. We know that that's how, how things work. So as platforms as, as um, pl platforms of scale emerge, as they really get to scale, we're going to see a truly disconnected ecosystem. And a truly disconnected ecosystem is going to make a huge difference for, for the medical system. That's going to require investment in open standards. Um, and for those of you who the technology bent, you'll know that there's been standards around in terms of technology and interoperability in this industry for a long time that haven't been well adopted. Yeah, that's going to change. It's going to have to in terms of those platforms. We at Genie are betting on fire. You know, we think the fire standard is a, is, is a breakthrough. Um, it's been adopted by very large companies around the world. And we think that's, the, you know, that's, that's got the ability to be a, an, an open standard that really fuels this, this kind of ecosystem. As this ecosystem um, connects, you're going to see curated marketplaces. So again, you know, making sure that the products that suit you are served up to you at the right time with recommendations, with guarantees, and with you know, true, true interconnection into your core, into your core workflow. Interoperability has been, been the holy grail in um, healthcare technology for a while, and it really hasn't been realised. But as we see these platforms emerge, those platforms deliver us a business model that will make interoperability a reality. And then, you know, what this really means is as we, we see those platforms scale, is that the economics of platform businesses will mean that open integrations becomes a business imperative. It will become a substantial issue for those technology businesses. They're not open and integrated. They, they literally won't, won't be able to exist as they do today. The fifth, so I promised you five big things that were going to happen. Um, the fifth, and, and I think the, the biggest, is that data is going to find its way out of the and it's going to power AI. I've been in the technology business for 25 years and seen lots of different things, um, technology trends come and go. And I've got to tell you that AI, you know, what we're going to see from artificial intelligence in the next 10 years is without question, and by far the most exciting and the most impactful. And you know, our industry, healthcare, is the industry that's gonna, gonna be most profoundly impacted and benefit from, from AI the most. We've just completed a, um, we've been working with a, an AI specialist consultancy doing some global research on you know, what EMR vendors should do to take advantage of this, of, of this shift to AI. And so there's three things that, that we can tell you fresh off the press that, um, that we think EMRs will deliver to you in terms of uh, um, AI. So firstly, um, EMR vendors will plumb AI directly into their cloud platforms, and that will allow you to truly automate your, your workflows. It will allow you to truly automate patient engagement workflows end-to-end, -to, -end, to dynamically prior prioritise and, and get dynamic checklists. So all the things that you're worrying about, you know, these results come in, do I have to check up with this patient, what's next, do I forget to order all that, order that test? That kind of stuff is going to be automated for you in a really safe way, um, in a really, a really reliable way. Um, and your revenue cycle, you know, for those of you in private practice. Sorry. Sorry. 
That's going to be the cloud as well. That's a good thing. See, I have a question about the cloud. It's alive. Sorry, it is Siri. I'm sure it's Siri that's Siri calling you. Let's just put that out of the way. Yeah, I'm sorry, but forgive me. So the so so and you know you're if you're in private practice, billing in this industry is is so complex and so difficult. Um, you know, and, and it's, it, it just shouldn't be. So AI, you know, we think AI can really automate that and uh, really take take away your revenue cycle management management issues. Secondly, you know, I'm just astounded by the explosion of data that is coming your way and you know, more astounded by how much more it's going to be over the next five years as the Internet of Things open up, as you know, your patients start pushing data to you, patient-generated data to you through, through wearables, etc. So AI, the promise of AI is it will manage that data for you and it will help you make sense of that. It will give you actionable insights. Um, both clinical and business insights. So really take that data, make sense of it, and allow you to take action <coughs> on insights. Give you the ability to benchmark, again, both from a business perspective and a clinical perspective. You know, how am I going amongst other people like me? How's this patient going you know, compared to other patients? Like this? Is this the best treatment plan? And you know, that shared data that allows ben benchmarking holds the promise of driving you know, really systemic improvements right across, across healthcare. The ability to have data that's shared in a de-identified, responsible, safe, secure way, and, and we can put all of the data that we have together um, is, is, is going to be absolutely game-changing. <coughs> and finally, you know, the big investment in, in AI, um, you know, per the previous <coughs> presentation, it's going into two areas, uh, diagnostic tools and intelligent clinical decision support. There's major players investing hundreds of millions of dollars in these solutions. Most of the solutions are pretty specialist um, specific, pretty narrow in their focus. And that means um, that vendors like us, you know, EMR vendors, are probably not going to go into that space. Of space. But as, as we move to platform business models, those you know, great innovative solutions will be plumbed into the platform, plumbed into your workflow so that they and seamless to, to you. So your EMR is going to be the integration and curation of those innovative, innovative solutions and make sure that you get the latest, latest technology when you when you do so I promised you five things that we're going to, going to change the EMR world and, and I think you agree if I'm, if I'm right and those five things do come to pass in the next five years that the, your electronic medical record really, really does have a bright future. I can, I can see some sceptical faces there. You, you look back over the last 10 years and you'd say, you know, look, how likely is, how likely is this change really happening uh, in the next five years? So, look, I'm, I'm an optimist. Can we ask questions? May I, may I tell you why I think it's going to change first? No, no, no. okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I think things are changing and I think there is, there's some really significant reasons why things are going to change moving forward and why these things are true. The first is two mega trends that are very clear and obvious that will drive massive change. The first is that payers are going to stop asking for efficiency, stop encouraging efficiency, they're going to demand efficiency. We all need to paper um, to, to, to know that our the cost of our healthcare system is, is unsustainable, and that pressure is really coming on the payers. That pressure is going to be passed on, on to you, and the way you're going to be able to deliver on that efficiency is through, is through technology. So that's going to see increased adoption. The other, the other thing that's changing is that your patients no longer you know, are, are kind of passive recipients of, of, of care; they are active consumers, and you know, they really their expectations have changed dramatically, step change in, in expectations, and they want you know, proper customer, customer experience. And this technology we're talking about <coughs> will allow you to deliver that seamlessly. Secondly, you know, if we look at what the technology over, over the last 10 years, technology's been growing, cloud's been around for a while, but it's only really in the last couple of years that we've seen a, a huge technology breakthrough. And that breakthrough comes from cloud, mobile and AI all making huge, huge steps forward. And that combination means we're at such an exciting point in terms of what technology can deliver 
And it is, it is really a paradigm shift from where we've been before, a true breakthrough in, in the technology. So the technology is, it makes, makes this possible. We're seeing, fourthly, we're seeing tech giants enter the health, health tech market. You know, Apple's making a huge plan here. Amazon, Amazon Web Service, Microsoft, Google, there's, there is billions of dollars being, being um, pushed into this technology in a way that we've never seen before. That will increase consumer expectations, change, the changing consumer expectations, and it will also enable huge change and huge innovation in the industry. And finally, you know, we're really starting to see strategic capital being invested in the, se in the sector in Australia. So private equity, um, more, more public, 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 equity, public market activity around this kind of thing. And that's required to build great technologies. It certainly doesn't come cheap. So that's why I'm an optimist, hopefully not a, not a blind optimist, and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, sitting down with you in five years and um, waiting for that's come through. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very exciting, I must admit. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Sandra Johnson. I'm a paediatrician. Is that working? Hey, Sandra. Yes. Uh, very exciting, I must say. I'm personally very uh, interested and intrigued by artificial intelligence, but I, I do hold quite a few concerns. I think. Uh, digital adoption has been slow in health, you're quite right. And I think that's because doctors are immensely concerned about the privacy of their patients. Things that happen in the room and the confidentiality that occurs there, it worries doctors about stuff being put in the kind of digital world such that others can access information that is quite confidential. So I think that's one concern that doctors hold, is how secure will these systems be? And with that in mind, I'd like to lead to the next question, and you can answer both, is about the cloud. You're implying that the cloud is quite secure. My understanding of it is that you can actually track things through the cloud. Highly sophisticated systems can hack the cloud. So could you make some comments about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So Thank the first thing is, I think, all of, all of our research says you're right. Doctors are very concerned about yeah. security. And that's great. You know, we're, all, we're all patients, so I'm, I'm very pleased that, that we should be that you're concerned about security. However, you know, the reality is that the, the technology in the cloud allows us to live a far, far greater security than we ever could um, in, 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 in a desktop or, or offline world. So you know, I'll give you an example. We had, a, we had a, a customer recently called up and said, look, we've just been hacked. We've got ransom, ransomware. I don't know if you heard of ransomware, but the, basically their database has been locked down. And um, you know we're being being demanded to pay thousands of dollars to, to get those patient records back, and so we're like, no problem, we can help you with that. Of course, you'll, you know we just need to go through your backup process, and how do you keep your backup? And I'm like, yeah, about the backup thing, you know, not not so much. So you know, that's a that that's a that's a difficult and a surprisingly common <coughs> conversation. It doesn't exist in the cloud. You know, we take care of care of all of that. So where do I want my patient record? Where do I want all, all my private details? Definitely sitting in the cloud, not sitting in. So you're the saying the cloud is quite secure then. I'm saying the cloud is relatively speaking, relatively way secure. way more secure than than having it in your. In what about the blockchain system? Wouldn't that be even more secure than a cloud? Blockchain takes security to a different level. Absolutely, level. absolutely. Yeah. But it doesn't have. It's not applicable to everything that we do right. in this kind of technology. Right. Okay. So you're very very confident of security. It's also worth thinking about the alternative. You know, like <laughs> there are trade-offs as you move to the cloud, but what's the what's the alternative? Um, and the alternative is is not working. <laughs> the question down the back. Is, um, I'll talk loudly while I'm waiting for the microphone. Sorry, oh, no, 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 that's it's all good. Just people at home. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, oh, thanks, Rihanna. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm a neurologist. Um, I, uh, I just first a comment and then a question. I think doctors are really concerned about security more than the patients are. I've never had a patient say to me, where's my data being uploaded to? I've had a million patients say to me, why can't you access my blood results requested by another specialist last week? Why don't you have access to my CT scan, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we probably need to move with the times a bit as a professional, because I think the patients have. Um, so that's my comment. But my question is, you know, in terms of the uptake of this, the, the interoperability which you commented on is a big hindrance because great, I, you know, I'm an early adopter, I love EMR, but the GP who I send the letter back to may only have a fax machine and so I can't use that sort of 
direct link through the software package to send the letter electronically, for example. Do you see a sort of hybrid model of interoperability bridging us through to the future where maybe these platforms can send via fax or, you know, sort of uh, interface with the existing technology uh, until we move through to the brave new world where we're all using this? Well, the first thing I think we should do is like burn the fax machines. Um, and they're not, they're not, it's not, not a viable technology for the future. It's not a conversation we, we should we should be having. Yeah, but they're still uh, they're yeah. still really popular, yeah. and, we, and, and so and I don't defend it, but I'm just thinking how can we sort of bridge our way through until they no longer exist. So I think I think the reality is that there needs to be a better solution, and there needs to be a, a better solution that's that's easy to use. You know, secure messaging today. You saw our stats. Only 52% of our customers, and you know, more than 50% of all um, private specialist practices use it, use our software in Australia. Only 52% of those are using secure messaging. And, and, and it's because it's really, really hard to use. And it's not properly interconnected. It doesn't, you know, you can't, you can't call from you using one and I'm using another. You can't send messages to each other, which would be like, you know, not being able to phone you from a, tel if you're on Optus and I'm on Telstra, not being able to talk. And, and that, that, those problems definitely have to be solved. But the, the good news is that from a technology point of view, those problems are, are relatively trivial. And so we can solve them. And, and I think that interoperability will, will allow us to, to, to make those changes and make those changes pretty swiftly. Um, is, there, is there a bridging, is there a bridging um, way, way forward? I think, I think there has to be. So there has to be a way for, you know, we can't say, look, you can only deal with a certain number of GPs that have adopted this technology. You can, you, you, there has to be a way of, of handling, handling it all. And so, you know, for example, as we move, move to the cloud, you know, all those secure messaging um, integrations are handled in the cloud. So we make that seamless, seamless for, from a customer's point of view. Um, just for example, I just want to pick up on Sandy's question about the cloud. Um, it always sounds as if I know what I'm talking about. I'm very much an analog baby boomer, but I understand <laughs> in other places that one of the big issues is where the cloud, the jurisdiction in which the cloud backup is done. And a number of companies now are requiring um, that the backup for the cloud is done in a jurisdiction that they can get access to. Um, and so, so absolutely, if you're, if you're using a cloud system, you know, my advice is you, you, know, you, you must have your patient data um, housed in the cloud. Um, if it's housed in the cloud, that cloud storage needs to be in Australia. And um, you know, definitely the Department of Human Services mandate that for us, we have to, in order to you know, interconnect to their systems, we have to comply, we have to have to be validated that that's, that that's the case. And but that's, that's very doable and um, very necessary as well. So it's, it's a good point. You definitely don't want to be um, you know, blindly using overseas products or not asking those questions. And you know, data security, uh, data and security, <coughs> vendors will do their, do their best, but it really is your responsibility to ask those tough questions. I'm glad you asked it, and I'm glad you said, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily know, know all the answers, but you've got to ask those questions. And you've, got to, you've got to ask those questions until, they make, until the answers make sense. And if they don't, or you can't get the answers, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't invest in that technology. You really should have it explained to you. It's a great question. I guess if the cloud fails, what's your plan? Oh, sorry. <laughs> If the cloud fails, what's your plan B? Now, I've been using computers since 83 and I have a sort of autistic love affair with them, but I've grown very cynical about them. And uh, when you use cloud-based technology, um, you have to have a plan B when internet access goes down. And in Australia, we might have three fibre optic connections to the rest of the world. And if that goes down, you're in a lot of trouble. Our data centre for New South Wales Health is in one location. You're in a lot of trouble when that goes down. So you you have to plan for redundancy. You know, the fight with Huawei is a perfect example of that. You talked about open standards. That's a difference between open source. Huawei owns 30% of the world's patents in 5G, which is an open standard. We're going to get into a really nasty fight when, if global collaboration at a technological level goes awry. So I guess I'm saying is it seems like a perfectly good idea, but when you actually get down to the practicalities, 
there are a number of things that we need to think forward because, you know, these medical records have to live for a year of 30 years. Now, don't get me wrong, I really believe in technology, but, you know, some of the terms artificial intelligence, there's nothing intelligent about this. This is predictive analytics. The human brain is intelligent. This is just a misnomer. So there's a number of comments there. I expect you and I are going to be on different sides of the debate. Which is fine, it's good to have a debate, but you know, there's, a, there's a couple of things there. Firstly, you know, I, I would say, you know, fundamentally disagree with you about the relative reliability of the you know, Any other way you're going to keep, keep my medical record is less reliable and less robust than the power of the might be. I think it's well, well supported um, and will become more so over the next five, five years. Now, we use Amazon Web Services to run our products. Have we had an outage in the last year? I think we had one for a minute and a half, and you know, it's back up. And you know, I can tell you the customers that use desktop, you know, the example I gave you before, you know, is it, far, far less reliable. I, I know that you know, for my money, my medical record sits, sits in the cloud every, every time. And then on the, on the artificial intelligence, not, not being intelligence, Look, I'm, I'm not, you know, artificial intelligence is a, is a specific definition around a, a series of technologies, you know, image recognition, voice recognition, um, machine learning, and, and those, those are the robotics, et cetera, and those are the things that make up the practice of artificial intelligence. And you know, I think, I, think um, I, I just disagree that they're, they're not intelligent. You know, I think if we look back at um, where we've come in the last 10 years from artificial intelligence, and you predicted that same path into the future, then I'd be sceptical. But I just don't think that's the case. I think we're standing on the precipice of you know, unprecedented, unprecedented exponential change in, in AI, and it's going to deliver you know, unbelievable value for us over the next five years. But I suspect you and I are going to disagree on that. Yeah, we could talk forever. <laughs> We've just got Thank one you. more question at the back here. Excuse me, I'm a real novice about computers. But who would own the medical records? Please, it was on the cloud. Would the person who owned the macro computer, or would we own? So the person that owns the license for the software owns the medical the medical record. So if you take a cloud cloud software, you own your medical record. You, you have it's yours. Nobody else can can access it. You should read your terms and conditions around around access to that and how that might that might be used. Uh, but you you definitely own that for sure. I can repeat the question for those I'm a happy genie user. Thank you. What's your solution for when someone like me eventually retires? I and my estate may need access to these records. Uh, you know, there's a long tail for medical legal. Um, and yet I may not want to pay your not inconsiderable license fee just so I can ma maintain access to ancient records. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I said the value could be non inconsiderable, but the fee's not, not inconsiderable either. So have you got a solution for that, a retirement solution? <laughs> Absolutely. So we have a, at any time, you can take a export of your data and keep that locally. But then what? How do I read it? It's in a, in a CSV file and you can access them back. And if you, if you had to spin up a full system, um, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're a couple of years into the, into the cloud, but I think there is a, there's an argument to say there's a you know, very low kind of Dropbox like <coughs> ongoing storage as a, as a solution there as well. You know, definitely, the data is yours, you can access it. And I get that. Might be worth writing one of your briefing notes about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, Gary Helfrey, just a quick word about artificial intelligence. I reviewed a case, I'm a cardiologist, reviewed a case last week where the artificial intelligence said the patient was low risk. Two days later, they dropped dead. Um, pretty good, our algorithm was completely uh, incorrect. But what I want to ask about is um, some surveys from doctors in the United States indicate one of the greatest sources of, of, of frustration and burnout is dealing with IT and electronic medical records. So I'm just wondering if you would like, to, and they're ahead of us, of course. So I'm just wondering if you'd like to comment about that. I would I think that goes to the heart of my second current problem: the user experience. And you know, you, healthcare IT is a UX train wreck. You know, like you look at, you know, we all use great systems. Um, I, you know, I deliberately use Apple devices because, in my view, they're at the cutting edge of, of UX, and as a 
a software person, I want to want to know what what the standard is. And you know, the, the the other end of the scale is is most healthcare IT systems. So you know, that that is at the heart of the problem, and that needs to change. For that to change, they should be a pleasure to use. They should be intuitive. They should make your make your, make your life easier. And, and you're right, they simply don't don't today because of that reason. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's <laughs> a really interesting talk. Thanks for, for taking the time to answer all our extensive questions. Our next speaker is uh, Rami. Rami is the CEO of Health, Health uh, Digital, a growing Australian digital health company dedicated to improving health outcomes by building innovative products that improve access to information and health practitioners. And technology is new. <laughs> So I'm uh, Rami Weiss, I'm the CEO of HealthShare. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight. Hopefully you find uh, what I have to say interesting. Um, so I've got uh, two key themes that uh, I'd like to talk about. Um, and this is a very interactive discussion. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me as I talk. I like to talk quickly. I'm really excited about what we do, but I might skip through some things that may not be so clear. So feel free to, to interrupt. Um, so just a bit of background about HealthShare. So we're an Australian digital health company. Uh, we've been around since 2010. So celebrating our nine year anniversary this year. Uh, and there's two key areas that we focus on. One is trying to help patients be better informed around their health decisions. Uh, and the second is building tools for health professionals to be more efficient in their practice, to improve their uh, consultations with their patients and a number of other different areas. So we've sort of got tools for patients and tools for, uh, for doctors. Um, and some of the talks tonight have been about the future um, and my slant is a bit more about evolution rather than evolution, which is the saying that we have in HealthShare, which is that it's important to bring all the stakeholders along on the journey. We love all the futuristic thinking, but actually you need to get today right, and then you need to bring people on the journey. So the two things I'm talking about today are themes that are happening today. Um, there's been a lot of change in these two themes over the last five, 10 years, uh, but they're actually what's happening today. Uh, and the first one is around patients being more empowered uh, when they're looking for the right health professional for their needs. Um, so all of you would be familiar with the traditional uh, way, the pathway that this happens, which is that the patient will go to the GP, they'll say you need to go and see a cardiologist, they'll write the referral for cardiologist Dr. X, and historically the patient would take that referral and would make the appointment and would go and see that cardiologist. That might be true for a portion of the population, but absolutely what we're seeing is a really big trend of patients being much more empowered to make their own decisions about who the right specialist is for them to see. Uh, and just to set some context about HealthShare, one of the tools we've got is healthshare.com.au, um, which is a patient-facing website also used by GPs 
Uh, and one of the most uh, popular areas of the website is a directory where patients can search for health professionals and read more about them. So their special interest areas, uh, their subspecialties, hospital affiliations, things like that. And this is an example of one of the profiles. Jason's been a great supporter of HealthShare since the beginning. And um, you can see the information that he's got up on there. Uh, and to sort of give you an understanding of how people are actually engaging with the website, if you are a little cynical, the patients are doing their own research, this data is actually showing the opposite, which is that over 500,000 people a month are using healthshare.com.au, and there's other sites out there where people are doing their research. Um, on average, when people are doing their research, they're looking at around four profiles, so they're comparing specialists doing their research around different areas that are important to them, which might be a combination of uh, location, availability, clinical expertise, cost. Um, the second component around how long they're spending searching for health professionals. This isn't just a, I'm going to land on a page, I'm going to find someone, I'm going to get out. They're actually spending their time doing their research. Um, and you might have seen stories about people on Facebook and social media also asking their friends, their, their colleagues, who would you recommend to go and see? So this is happening today across lots of different patient facing channels. Um, and the third part is people are then actually transacting in, in the sense where they're picking up their phone and they're calling health professionals uh, to make appointments. Um, there's a really big thing that's happening around the open referral. And I'm not sure how familiar um, all of you are, but technically a GP who writes a referral for a patient to Dr. X cardiologist, that patient can take that referral letter and can actually go to any cardiologist that they want with that referral letter without the GP actually needing to rewrite the referral letter and address it to this, to another cardiologist. So, and the government's doing a big push to try and have this open referral portability be a bigger issue to clarify the rules because a lot of specialists and practices are nervous about accepting referrals that aren't addressed to them. But technically, the way that it is, is that a patient can take that referral and go to see any cardiologist or any specialty in this, any specialist in the specialty that the GP has decided to make the referral. Um, so that's, I think, a trend that's only going to increase as patients do more and more research here and see the benefits of, of being empowered before they go to see the specialist. Another example of a theme that we've seen, and this is just an example on, on HealthShare, but it exists other places, is patients having reviews, writing reviews about specialists. Um, and to be clear, ARPA is very specific about what's allowed from a review perspective. So you are not allowed to give a clinical review. You can't say this cardiologist was the best or did the best job for me, but you can provide non-clinical feedback and patients are doing that. So in this example, patients are able to talk about a specialist bedside manner they're able to talk about whether the, whether the specialist explained the patient's condition to them clearly, whether the specialist explained their treatment uh, recommendations to the patient clearly. Uh, and we've seen on the website, patients are doing this in the thousands. Um, and an interesting thing that many specialists, when we spoke to them initially, when we were launching this feature was, people were gonna have all these patients who have gripes with what, we're, what we've done to them. Um, even though we've done the right clinical thing, they might get annoyed and they're gonna give us a bad review. That's actually not what we've seen at all with the data. Out of the over 5,000 reviews that we've seen so far, I think the average rating out of five is 4.95. Um, and some of the um, information that people provide, the patients provide, on the, on the public facing side on HealthShare, you can only see the ratings um, in the stars, but privately patients are able to provide feedback to specialists to help them improve their practice. And some of the feedback that we hear from specialists of patients who have written these uh, feedback points are just amazing. Like it just shows you what an important job specialists are doing um, and it's flowing through from the, the review side of things. But the sort of takeaway is that patients want to write, read reviews. Um, they read reviews on, on travel and other uh, restaurants. It's not about clinical, it's about how did the doctor engage with me? Did they listen to my concerns? Did they explain things clearly? It's much more about the EQ side of how the doctor-patient relationship is than necessarily the clinical side. And it's happening today. Another component is enhancing your profile online with rich media. So by rich media, an example is, is videos. So we have lots of specialists that upload onto their profile uh, videos talking about either their special interest areas um, or questions that their patients might typically ask. Uh, we provide the forum because 
We do see the patients are engaged. They want to see the personality of the specialist. They want to make sure that they uh, gel with what they're, what they're seeing on, on the video. Um, so that's, that's something that we're seeing a lot of. And also Q&A that patients are asking on the website. So patients are asking questions about um, certain uh, recovery times from a, a, a certain procedure or, or whatever it might be. Specialists are coming in and providing their feedback as well, which also enhances their profile. Another service that we run um, is called specialistnow.com.au. Uh, and the reason why we launched this website uh, was that we kept hearing from patients that the GP would write a referral to a specialist. The patient would then get home, call that specialist, and it ended up being a four, five, six month wait list, and the patient didn't know what to do next. And that resulted in multiple issues um, of the patient getting sicker or the patient having mental health issues off the back of not being able to see a specialist. And we thought there's got to be an opportunity to try and make the process more efficient. And having the patient require them to go back to the GP to try and get another referral, it's just a very inefficient process. So what we launched about six months ago, um, a bit longer, um, was the service specialist now.com.au. Um, we've had over yeah, three and a half thousand patients who have come through this channel. Um, specifically, we make sure they've got a referral from their GP before we do the match. And then we match them with specialists who might have last minute cancellations to try and make the, uh, the workflow more efficient to allow specialists to fill their empty slots, but also to provide patients who don't have a short wait time for the specialist that they were given from their GP to try and help them um, see someone sooner. And we've got these incredible testimonials again, which just show how important it is to try and make the process more efficient, how it impacts on patients' lives. Uh, and the, the second component to that, it's you know, super important to have the information available to the patient, but of course, just as important is having accurate information available to the GP at the time of referral. So if any of you have visited a GP clinic and looked at the address book of the specialists, you probably would be quite uh, in horror at what you saw. Information that was out of date, specialists that had retired, specialists that had passed away, specialists that were working in wrong locations, no information on subspecialties, on special interest areas, information that the GP needs to know to make an appropriate referral decision, is not there at their fingertips, and that's impacting the referral workflow. The specialists lose out, the GPs lose out, lose out, and the patients lose out. It's, it's a broken system. So something we launched um, over five years ago now is having our directory available inside the GP clinical software. So our directory is available inside both medical director and best practice, which as you're probably familiar, is around 90% of the GP market um, from a clinical software perspective. And GPs are able to, inside their clinical software, search for a specialist based on their specialty, their location. Um, and in their, at their fingertips, inside the clinical software, they can click on write referral and it can integrate it into their letter writer workflow and they can write the referral to the patient. They can even print out the profile of the specialist. So together with the referral letter, they can give them a, a printout of the patient of the specialist information in terms of their, their specialties, um, their subspecialties, whatever it might be. Um, so GPs love it because it's a great adjunct to giving just a referral letter. Uh, patients are better informed and specialists are able to put the information they want to make sure the patient's aware of before they come and see them. Um, so that's that's one that's the other component. Um, so that's sort of the end of the first theme and I, I guess the key takeaway regardless of whether it's on HealthShare or anywhere else, I think it's super important for all of you to have an online presence. At the very least, I think it's really important to list your, loca your practice location information. I think information about your areas of expertise, your, your uh, special interest areas, a bio, photos, whether it's your own website or on HealthShare, I think that information is critical because patients are doing their research. Um, so a quick plug on HealthShare is that I encourage you all to claim your profile. There's no cost to it. Um, you can put all your information in there and then it becomes available to patients and to GPs. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Do anyone have any questions on that before I move on to the second thing? Okay, cool. So second thing uh, is enhancing the doctor-patient consultation. Uh, so we think the current process today is inefficient, um, both for GPs and specialists when patients are coming to them. On the GP side, the GP doesn't know the agenda of the patient before they walk in. They don't know whether the patient's got some actually clinically important information or they just want to talk about something that may not be as clinically appropriate. So they don't have control of the consultation. Um, on the specialist side and the GP side, there's this continuing issue of documentation and admin. And in the US, especially, and James sort of alluded to it in one of the questions in the back, the burnout 
um, problem is only getting worse. And the US, you've got the EMRs. I'm sure James and Jeannie will do a much better job on making it better in Australia. But the reality is doctors are feeling that admin burden, that documentation burden, there's more expectations on what you need to get done. And all you want to do is actually help the patient, engage with them. You went to medical school to focus on clinical care, not on documentation, not on having to spend all this time on admin. So that's sort of something that's only getting worse. Um, and on the other side is you've got patients who want their health professionals, their clinicians to be more tech savvy. So they don't want to fill out a clipboard that's, in, you know, when they walk into the practice, that's a paper-based clipboard, which then they have to scan in to the clinical software, and then they're reading in this clunky handwritten form, which the doctor can't even see. They're wasting valuable time understanding what the patient's actually written. Um, and patients are frustrated, of course. They've gone to the GP and they've filled out this information. They've gone to the specialist. They've gone to the physio. They've gone to all these different clinicians. And here they are filling out the same information again and again. So the process is broken. It's inefficient. Everyone suffers. Um, so we think we've got a solution. There's probably lots of other ones out there, but I'll just tell you about what we've built and what's live today. Um, and the product's called Better Consult. Uh, and what it is, is a pre-consultation clinical questionnaire that a patient fills out before seeing the doctor. Uh, so 24 hours before the appointment, we send an SMS to the patient, ask them to please fill out this pre-consultation questionnaire. Uh, and once they get the SMS, and I'll take you through the workflow, we ask them all the key clinical information that as a clinician, you'd like to know. So what's their presenting symptoms? What's their medications? What's their allergies? What's the past medical history? I'm sure you all have frustration to one degree or another about the referral letters that you get from GPs that say, thank you for seeing X for opinion and management. And then you're basically starting from scratch to have to, um, to, have to understand why the patient coming to see you. Uh, so this tool we think can help with that. And then once the information is captured from the patient, uh, we then translate the answers into a medical summary. So instead of you having a blank uh, progress notes when you open up the, the clinical software, instead you've got a bullet point summary of all the key clinical information in medical speak uh, for you to be able to then use as a basis to do a deeper history taking um, and, and focus on treatment. So here's how it works. Um, let's see if this plays. Oh, okay. So the patient gets the SMS saying, please fill this out. Um, they, it's all mobile optimized, so they're not downloading an app. Um, they log in, they have an account, uh, and the reason why they have an account is so that we don't ask them the same information again and again. We then have them tick a box to say the doctor's not going to look at this until I'm actually with the patient. And then we ask them, what's the main reason you're seeing the doctor? As you start typing in, we've got hundreds of thousands of different symptoms and synonyms that the patient can put in. They choose headache as an example. Um, and then we'll ask the questions and take them through the clinical workflow. So how often is it happening? How painful? Um, you know, and then we go through best and worst and average pain. We ask them about, um, let's see what's next, impacts on your life. So all the questions and multiple choice um, answers, all in plain English for the patient to be able to understand. We've also got a multi-language uh, feature that we've built so patients can be asked questions in their language that they speak rather than only in English, still with the output being translated into English. Um, there's a whole long workflow I didn't take you through here, but basically we go through all of it. And then at the end, what comes up is an example like this. So the text is quite small, but I'll just sort of read it out. Presenting for headache, onset three days ago, symptom occurs continuously. Uh, average pain is eight out of 10, described as deep or aching pain, triggered by post-stress time and bright light or glare, exacerbating factors, relieving factors, impacts on function. And then we do a body system by body system clinical review of all the key information to flag relevant negatives, the flag the symptoms that the patient has, um, oral fullness, ocular pain, cough, poor concentration, feeling stress and anxiety. Uh, we go through past medical history, as I mentioned, medication. We find out what medications they're taking, what's the indications for those medications. Uh, we're about to launch a feature where you can take a photo of the medication pack and it'll actually um, correlate with the TGA and translate that. So you've got accurate information about medication, not just what the patient might think they have. So because they're filling this out when they're at home, we're finding the patients are walking to the medicine cabinet can take a photo and actually get, have accurate information so you're not wasting your time. Um, so we've got medications, we've got family history, social history, and we've got all, this, all these other modules as well. Um, here's an example with, uh, around joint pain. Um, you can just see the level of associated symptoms here, that if you were doing your own history taking in and of itself, you'd probably spend a good chunk of time trying to take it. At the very least now, before I even walk in, you've got this information 
and you can process it, and then you can spend the time to do as you want, to go into a deeper history taking, depending on what the presenting symptom is. But we're providing that information, and instead of having to type it all and not actually engage with the patient, we've written it for you. You can spend the time now to engage, to talk about treatment, to talk about any other questions the patient has. So in line with trying to reduce the, the admin and documentation burden, ideally, you shouldn't have to do it at all. You should just be able to verify, make a few tweaks, and then it's done. <laughs> and from the patient's perspective, what we're finding is that patients are actually thinking through their symptoms before they come to see you. And that's a really powerful thing. We've heard it again and again from clinicians that the patient's thinking through, Lord, about my symptom, when did it start? How, how, when is it better and where is it worse? They're thinking through all this. So then they walk into you, they're actually in the mindset of the consultation before it's even started. So we think that's really powerful. Um, just from a data and privacy perspective, James had all the hard questions, so I, uh, I don't know if I could ask these again, but uh, everything's encrypted end to end. We've had independent penetration testing to test the system. We can't see any of the patient identifying data. Um, there's no third party tracking software. We spent a lot of time on security around that, but happy to go into more detail if anyone has any questions. Um, and then you sort of got the future. Um, so we've talked about AI, there's lots of potential. In our, in our mind, you've got to start with step one, which is what we've got, which is let's start getting patients answering these questions. Let's start seeing the data that's generated. Because the data is all in a structured format, we think we're in a really great position to eventually be able to use structured data to help inform decision making around that. You know, you're able to analyze test results and other investigations and be able to provide smart, smart uh, summaries to the clinician. Um, James touched on it as well around PROMS, patient reported outcome measures and being able to use the patient interaction through this questionnaire to be able to provide you insights over time and see how the patient's going with the treatment. Uh, and finally, actually writing your letter back to the GP. So instead of having to use the dictaphone, the letter's written for you, you make a few tweaks, and we cut down on the time you're spending with that. So we had a great quote that one of the clinicians <laughs> is using Better Consult uh, told us recently, which was, we're making medicine fun again. Um, that's a really nice thing. We know how much uh, you've got on your plates. We know all the challenges you're dealing with and anything that can be done to try and improve it, we think um, is something worth, uh, worth striving for. Um, so we've got lots of other, um, other, theme, other uh, modules that we're building out, um, but we know we've got to start now. Uh, we've got almost 500 practices either live or about to go live, so it's been a fantastic um, initial experiment. We're seeing the doctors the same time in the consultation, seeing patients are happier. Um, it's a really nice start, but there's so much more that, uh, that we want to do. Um, so that's, that's, I think, the end. Um, I might have talked very quickly, but um, those are the two things. Uh, and thank you. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Thanks for having me on that, Mark Arnold. Um, I'm actually seeing North Zero One, but it was all about for that. Um, <laughs> Do you like it now? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, look, I think there's a fundamental question. How do you make the money? Mm -hmm. How do you stay in business if it's free to us? And is, it, is there a charge to the patient? Who pays? Yeah, so on the, um, on the referral directory side, um, it is free for patients, it's free for GPs, and it's free for specialists to create their profiles. Where we make money is three different areas. One of the areas um, you might have seen, but uh, there's a hospital search option. So the GP can search by an ONG in North Shore Private and can see the, the specialists, the OBS that are delivering babies out of North Shore Private Hospitals, pay us like Ramsey, to make that information available at the GP's fingertips, as opposed to the books that traditionally they would ship around and give to GPs, which were out of date straight away. Um, the second area, uh, we've got a filter for private health insurance. So private health insurance, um, uh, private health insurers give us uh, data on the um, gap scheme participation for specialists. So the GPs, when their patients say, I'm with X Health Fund, does this specialist participate in the gap scheme? The GP's got that information at their fingertips to be able to make a better informed decision. Um, and the third area is we've got uh, premium positions for specialists who are looking to grow their referral base or might have added a new specialist to their practice or might have moved into a new area and doesn't yet have an established referral base. We work with specialists uh, to, um, to provide <coughs> leadership to GPs in the area, to write fact sheets, to, um, to have their information about uh, they might have a no gap. Um, for pensioners or, or same urgent appointments or things like that, we provide specialists the opportunity to provide that information. There's sort of a premium offering on that. Thank you.
Right, I'm not going to question you about interoperability. I mean, I can't even get Microsoft Word to talk to Microsoft Outlook. Um, this is one platform. There are many others that GPs use, many others in hospitals, and now the My Health Record. What's going to drive the lowest common denominator? Will there be one system that beats all the rest, like Apple, or, or will there be cooperation? I think in the ideal world, there's cooperation, because I think regardless of who you are, you're not going to be able to do everything, even with the resources of Apple. And as James had mentioned, there's lots of other fantastic companies that are out there that are doing great, great things now. So the ideal is not that one company should have everything. I think the ideal is that there is interoperability between these tools, that they can work seamlessly. Uh, before the App Store it used to be, how does a phone have you know, seamless um, applications that can easily bolt on to what you're already doing in your day to day? And Steve Jobs created the App Store. And now today it's, it's commonplace and uh, people aren't surprised that that's seamless. So I think, for example, with Better Consult and, and our referrals tool, both of them are integrated into the clinical software. For the GP, it's seamless. Um, so we think it's possible, um, but there's always challenges. You have gotta remain optimistic in healthcare. I've got one. I'm, I'm curious, if you do a Better Consult, have you got any data about whether people are more likely to turn up for their consult and not be failure to turn up? Um, we don't have any data on that right now. Pardon? We don't have any data yet I on that. I think really interesting because they've invested a lot more of their time and energy and I think that's a great motivator. So I would imagine that there'd be fewer failures to turn up. Yeah, that would be fantastic. That would be case. It would be good to look into that. Sorry, sir. I've been working in this area for also about 15 years. I think ultimately there's not a the AR person that exists now is still a nurse manager who takes this information and makes the decision. I don't think AI is nearly close to the, the sort of position where it can take and integrate data. So I think what you're doing here is assisting and facilitating, but AI is nowhere here. I think it, uh, a year ago, The Economist published an article it was AI written and it was just gibberish. It was a whole lot of rubbish. It had the sense of the way they write the article, but the article was junk. So I still think, and a year ago or two, I think I saw Enrico and he said to me, don't get involved in any particular company. Make sure the companies can deliver what you, what you need. So I think the more people in the market, the better, but I still think AI as it is now is still with a good team of case managers we look who can I think your tools help facilitate it. That's probably where we are now. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you're, you're spot on. I think any tool needs to aid the doctor, not replace the doctor. Because I think regardless of the AI delivering a bad diagnosis to a patient, no matter how accurate it might be, is not something that should be done by a machine. And I think all the tools that hopefully are happening today um, are about aiding the clinician, trying to improve on inefficiencies, trying to help them in their decision-making process. I think anything else that's doing that is is not what's the right approach. Um, in the future, who knows, but certainly not right now. It's one more over there. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the U.S. health system has NCAFs, which is quite a powerful tool of consumer evaluation of health care, not only because it feeds back about systems and individual doctors, but it actually contributes to a funding system within the hospital structure. And I've seen examples in U.S. hospitals where the department gets some feedback from NCAF and then they help one of their colleagues learn how to be nicer to patients and be a better doctor. I, I think we're seeing that a bit with white coat, I think. And I'm just wondering whether is your technology at a stage where it's part of a marketing process or are you also thinking of an insurance process to help those doctors who may be struggling <coughs> to get some information about what they need to do to be better doctors? Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly on the rating side that I showed earlier, um, there is that free text um, ability for a patient to provide feedback to specialists. Um, and we know that specialists are reading that and they're using that to improve their, their practice. We've heard that feedback directly. Uh, in terms of better consult, 
part of the vision of where we want to take this is to continue that engagement with the patient in a way that can aid the doctors understanding how that patient's treatment is going. So I think once you've done that, then you've got a very structured pathway to be able to analyze the data, provide insights and help improve clinical care. Thank you. That was a very informative talk. Our last speaker is Professor Enrico Coera. Enrico is a Foundation Professor of Medical Informatics and the Director of the Centre for Health Informatics, Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University, a group which he co-founded in 2000. And we nearly got the, the perfect question as a segue to his talk. Um, thank you. Well, um, I thought since it was the last talk, I'd have to have a question that would keep you awake. <laughs> I think there's a new Terminator movie coming, so maybe the answer is we're all gone. Um, what I'd like to do, I guess, is to um, give you a sense of where we really are, uh, and then get you to start to think about what that means for you, maybe as a colleague, um, what it means in terms of education, uh, and, and Government policy. You know, there, there are a lot of ramifications. So um, it's interesting to me. I've been in this space really for 30 years, and I'm kind of amused that in the last four years this has become big again. And um, the reason it's become big is because AI is now driving so much consumer tech. So your smartphone, your Google search, your Facebook feed, they're all optimized by machine learning and AI. These companies are literally making billions and billions out of it. And so, so they have invested in, in pushing this technology forward. And given that the biggest vertical market, as I'd like to say, is healthcare, it's no surprise, having conquered search and social media, that they're now thinking, where else do we go? And then where else is, is healthcare? Largely in North America, but they're coming elsewhere. So why, why the interest? Um, we heard at the beginning of the evening a bit about deep learning and machine learning, and, and the message here is that there has been a, a fundamental revolution in our ability to interpret images of all forms. Um, uh, yes, on Google you can do a search for pictures of cats, but now we can interpret um, clinical images to at expert or beyond expert level, um, which is fairly impressive. Uh, and so this has happened really in the last three or four years. And again, the volume of money involved now in creating machines that will do the work of image-based clinicians is you know. um, But it's not just that um, we're focusing on diagnosis or images. AI really is doing other things. This is from JAMA last week, just to show we're current. And, and this was a very different form of machine learning. This is about discovery. So here they were looking at 200,000 patients, got the clinical records of those patients, they all had sepsis, and they tried to work out were there different phenotypes that would have different clinical outcomes and might perhaps require different treatments, and they found four different groups <coughs> uh, using the machine learning methods. So it, it's not just that we're talking about um, changing clinical work, but it might be the engine of, of research itself that changes eventually. So it is really interesting and exciting. Um, sadly, the rhetoric, especially from Silicon Valley, is not let's make healthcare better, it's AI versus MD, it's let's replace clinicians. And that, and that discussion is very unhelpful to say the least, um, partly because it's not likely to happen anytime soon, but also because it misses the point, which is what we're trying to do is to augment humans. So we want to be better at what we do, we don't want to be replaced. Um, but still, you know, there's the rhetoric. If, if you look at x-rays, if you're a dermatologist, AI is coming for you. If you're an ophthalmologist, you're in trouble. Um, in fact, on that list of AIs that we talked about at the beginning of the evening, um, one of the ones for diabetic retinopathy um, diagnosis is certified to be used without a physician. So that can just be used, get a diagnosis and off you go in the US. Now, for all the excitement, there are real problems, and, and IBM Watson is a good one. So IBM Watson, famous for win, winning Jeopardy, um, under dubious circumstances, I have to say, um, uh, had a huge investment in, in Watson for oncology, the idea that it would 
make recommendations about which protocols were most appropriate for patients. Uh, and all its large customers have basically abandoned Watson in the last couple of years because it just hasn't done what was promised. Um, and probably there was a lot of hype involved in, in that whole business process, I've got to say. So I think IBM has learned a lesson, but it's also given a, a black mark to, to um, people who are getting a bit too early. Having said that, there are, there are <coughs> real surprises. And one of the biggest surprises to me is uh, what's happening in primary care. Um, and, and Remy showed you his, his little pre-consultation device. So that, that app now is the beginning of a business model for a company called Babylon Health in London. <coughs> So patients um, enrolled with Babylon GP practices, which I think are in Fulham in London, three or four of them, but they've got 50,000 patients on their books and they can be anywhere in the London area. And they interact with the primary care through that app. They give their symptoms in. They then get a diagnosis from that machine, which I have to say is not always correct. Um, and then they might have a teleconsultation or very rarely they'll go and see the patient in, in, the, in the practice. Um, and that model has resulted in practices that are in the Babylon catchment losing all the young, healthy patients who are very tech turned on. And they're left with a smaller book of patients, a small amount of money to look after the, the older and the quite real. So it's actually disrupting mm -hmm. NHS business models, uh, even if it's a flawed technology. So it's already going. And, and the other thing is that that model is, is actually even more effective in the United States where they have a such a dysfunctional health system that anything that can cut the middleman out, they actually have a non-functioning primary care system, as far as I can tell. But this is so you'll be seeing you'll be seeing Walmart doing this, you'll be seeing Amazon doing this. It's it's really quite amazing. Um, just to let you know, this has been around for a long, long, long time. As I said, I've been at it for 30 years. The first paper in, in, in the AI medicine field, you know, comes back in 1959. Um, the first radiology paper was 1963. Uh, and the history of this whole discipline is, is success and failure. So back in 1969, famous MIT professor Marvin Minsky said, there's no future in neural networks. So they were abandoned. You know, when I did my doctorate, nobody did neural networks. Um, but they now are the, the transformational technology, at least for imaging. Um, and then around the mid-90s, after a huge boom and a lot of excitement investment, we went through what we call the AI winter, where basically you couldn't get funded to do AI work and the whole technology that was been built was abandoned. We're now back in the next boom, and the question for you, for all you Game of Thrones folks is, is winter coming again? <laughs> uh, are we going to be having another, another period where people now say, well, that was a disaster? My sense is no. My sense is it's here and it will stay. How fast it will happen, uh, how disruptive it will be are questions for historians to ask in a hundred years' time. But just to give you a sense of what other people are doing, so in the NHS in England, they've allocated one billion pounds just to, to embed AI-based cancer therapy across the English NHS. That's a very big bet. Um, that's independent of the Babylon private healthcare stuff. Um, Lord Darcy um, did a large review of NHS and he said we can save 10% of NHS budget just through automation. So you can imagine, I think we heard earlier in the evening that there is a drive for efficiencies in quotes. Um, the drive to reduce costs and, and the cost of the technology have caught the attention of governments. Um, and I'll just move on for the purpose of time. So just to give you a sense of where we are, what is the state of the art? The state of the art is I can build, if I've got the right data sets, a brilliant machine that will do a single thing. It'll interpret TB lung nodules and do nothing else. You know, it's not going to be radiologists. So if we're going to have AIs that interpret images, you're going to have to have a whole suite of them, each doing a different task. There's no AGI on, on the near-term horizon that I've seen, no artificial general intelligence, <coughs> no Arnold Schwarzenegger T2 or T3 that, 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 I, that we're aware of. However, we don't know where those breakthroughs will be and whether they happen in one, two, or five, or ten years' time. Um, and, and believe me, there are people who are spending money trying to build these things. So I started, I remember when I stopped clinical medicine and went and did AI back in the 80s, I was so excited, you know, we're going to take over medicine and change it. 
and now I'm, I'm kind of dreading the reality of it arriving. Um, so just to give you a sense in, in, in real numbers about what, what AI can do. So the first slide here is the red bar is how good humans are, the blue bar is computer AI performance, and the first task here is detecting objects visually, what you might call a where's Wally task. And you can see that the AI is much better at picking images than we are. Cameras looking down on crowds, picking faces out. They're really excellent at doing that. So, so image detection is really something that's been won. Speech recognition, at least for single speaker on the phone, equal human performance. So, um, although Siri, my Siri at least, doesn't do that. Um, this other one, though, is to give you some comfort. So this is question answering. So this is where you would ask the AI a question that required knowledge about the world. Um, what's the capital of Argentina? Uh, who is the Prime Minister of England? Um, would be a harder question. Um, <laughs> and you can see that where, where you need to know more about the world, where it's not just a question of matching patterns that you've seen before, when we, we are still struggling to build systems that can do that. And, and the harder set of tasks is to explain pictures. What's happening in this image? You know, is that a, a cow sitting on top of the car? So it's very easy to fool AIs um, because they don't have yet the sort of understanding of how the world works that we would as humans build up. So when they have that notion of how things actually operate in the world, then they can get better. But so that, those benchmarks have been fairly steady now for a few years. Uh, it shows you again why imaging is such a, a rich area for AI in medicine. Okay, so um, sh should we trust should we trust the machine uh, and, and what it says? Um, it's a complicated question, isn't it? Because um, on average, a well-trained AI will do better than, than clinicians, but it'll still have false positives, false negatives, different ones to the way you do. So the first thing I, I would like to do is to think about the ethics of, of having an AI do something in healthcare. And these are the very famous Asimov laws, which you all know, don't hurt people, do what you're told, uh, don't blow yourself up, don't destroy humanity. <laughs> Basic rules, children are taught these. And um, it's interesting that none of these rules hold in clinical health, uh, because we hurt patients, maybe to help them, uh, we make very tough decisions. Um, so uh, Ken Hillman, a colleague of mine, some of you may know, Ken is very interested in end of life and end of life management. Um, uh, and uh, one of the things that he and his team have done over the years is to, is to build algorithms to take people at risk of in-hospital death. And it turns out that we can, with lots of, our, lots of different people have now built these algorithms with very high precision, can say who's most likely to die in hospital tonight. We can predict that very well. So the question is really, what do you do with that knowledge? You know, um, Ken's interested in triggering end of life conversations with, with families. Um, you might want to be, um, you know, escalating care for people who, who might be at risk. Um, but it's, it's a short hop to the next point where the AI start to influence the decisions that are being made. Um, and you can imagine scenarios where people might want to do that, maybe with end of life, there's always a, a, a physician involved in the discussion, but um, imagine a large, a large um, civilian catastrophe. You can imagine us using point of care devices, little phones to do triaging, who lives, who dies. Here's a picture. Um, we might have um, quarantine situ situations where you decide who gets quarantined, who doesn't, based on, uh, I don't know, a, 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 rapid, um, a rapid test to see they've been exposed to a virus. It's very easy to imagine a slippery slope where these, these technologies start to get used in certain circumstances. And there are fundamental ethical questions that we haven't answered about whether that's the right thing to do or not. Now, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but we don't have the language to discuss it. We haven't thought about it. And while there's a huge history of, of ethics in our professions, this is a, a new set of ethical challenges. Okay, if that wasn't enough, let's think about um, what it might be like for you to be working with an AI in the future. Um, you know, you've got all that knowledge about people and how the world works. Um, the AI is an idiot savant, brilliant at looking at lots of data and, and helping you in the way. Um, 
So that would sound like the perfect world. And when have we ever used machines and relied on them? And then we had trouble. <laughs> Do we ever become dependent on technology? And the answer, of course, is obviously, yes, we do very stupid things because we trust tech already. Um, and uh, has anybody gone on a GPS misadventure? Hands up. It's a universal experience, right? It is. And because you trust it. Um, uh, and does it? It's not just that we trust it, but we put our lives in its in its hands. So, um, you know, this is a good example of, of a person who is so so enamoured with his Tesla, and you know, I would like a Tesla. If Tesla's a movie, um, <laughs> that uh, he he stopped paying attention. It was in auto mode. He watched Harry Potter, and, and it, it's it's a fantastic set of technology behind the Tesla, but it's not ready for full autopilot, you're still meant to keep your hands on the wheels. Mm -hmm. So these are both examples of what we call automation bias, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the tendency of humans to, to trust technology when it shouldn't be necessarily to be trusted. Uh, and there are plenty of examples of that already with the technology you already used. There was a medical legal case, I think, in this state a couple of years ago, where, where a, a primary care physician um, prescribed the one cocktail of drugs and, and a patient died. And the defense was, well, the medication system I used, the prescribing system, didn't alert me that this was a bad combination of, of, of drugs. So therefore, I thought it was safe. I didn't need to exercise my clinical profession. Um, brackets, the alerts had been turned off anyway, so they wouldn't have worked. But so, of course, the court said, I'm sorry, you're responsible. You're, you're the caring position. And so, again, where are the boundaries as, as these technologies get involved in the decisions that you might be making or, or you might say, look, I made this decision based on the advice of who's responsible, the software provider, the original data set that has trained the AI, or you for not paying attention. A big issue. Um, so, the, so the big digital health trade-off that we have with all technology is that, is that typically care is safer with digital health. It really is. All the studies I've seen show reductions in safety and quality problems. Um, but if you do it badly, you can still hurt people. And, and it's, it's really the classic paradigm, isn't it, where, where you improve care through an intervention, but you generate new side effects, epigenic harm, new classes of harm. And so while these technologies are going to make things better, assuming they have been well developed and trialled and tested before they come in, there will be new things going on that um, have never happened before. And automation bias is a good example. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, I think, um, before I talk about what we do as clinicians or professionals, is to, is to, you'll probably be reading papers in the journals about machine learning and AI and how wonderful they are. And I'll say, look, we've trained on this, it's better than a human, you know, aren't we fantastic? Um, but that really is just the beginning of a journey. Uh, you know, you've got the data, uh, you capture the data, you build your machine learning models, but then it's got to somehow be embedded in a work practice. It needs to be embedded in an organisation, in your own workflow for your own patients. And that is hard and a different class of problem. And we know from implementation science that outcomes for the same tech in different organisations are different because local factors shape so much. So it's sort of irrelevant that, um, you know, the receiver operating characteristic curve is blah, 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 or the precision is 99.9 because it says nothing about what will happen to care in the real world. Will outcomes change? Um, will there be new harms because of the way you're organised? Um, one, one interesting tidbit is that um, the great group in Adelaide, the Machine Learning Institute, and they focused a little bit on healthcare and they, a couple of months ago on hip fracture detection. And they built a machine learning system that did that. And they asked the question, what features of the images or the data did the AI use to decide it was a hip fracture? And some of the most powerful features were ward number, caring doctor. Clearly what the AI had learned was what it means to be a hip fracture in this, in this hospital. And they hadn't extracted the features that actually had to do with the radiology. So that technology would poorly generalise, you might predict. <laughs> yeah. so, so real world is very important. Um, 
Yeah, I like this slide, you know, so uh, <laughs> work is imagined uh, and then you know, work is actually done. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably so important. So uh, here's a summary of, of my thoughts about how the sorts of things you would put into education for a clinician. So if I'm using an AI, before you look at the answer, I'd be saying, what do you think is going on? Form your own impression of the case. Otherwise, you're at risk of being biased by the technology. Um, what, how good is this AI on this disease? Because it may have been exposed to a very small sample of this disease compared to other things in, in training set. It may not actually be very good at this, even though it seems certain. So is, is this actually the right AI for the task? Um, we heard about explainability earlier in the evening. Why does it say X or Y or Z? Um, if it's a black box, how comfortable then are you as a clinician in, in following through on a black box recommendation? This is very important. Do you know things the AI doesn't? You know, did, did you see something on the way the patient came in or the way um, you know, maybe somebody in the family was reacting to them? Do you know something about their past history? Do you know about something that's happening in the local area? Those extra pieces mean you know more and therefore you should recalibrate whatever is said based on your local information. Um, we heard before about the importance of the training set, in other words, the data that AI sees to build its models. It needs to be representative of your population. Um, there was a, a, a paper in Lancet that I reviewed 26 months ago, uh, CTs for, for um, um, some brain um, scans, and there was a Chinese study, very large, very well done, but the populations varied across different regions. And so the AI performed very differently even across different mainland China hospitals, just because of variation in local case mix. It's a very important issue. Um, maybe moving to the last couple, um, is this patient complex? Are they multi-morbid? Um, if so, it's unlikely today's AI has seen anything like that before or can unpack it. They're very good at Single, single diagnosis, single, single matching. Multi-morbidity tends to, you know, it's much more predictable what you see. It's never quite how it should be. Um, and that would require that sort of model-based or world-based reasoning I talked about before with image interpretation. You'd actually need to know medicine to do that. Um, and actually that example I told you about uh, X-rays, fractures and ward numbers, it's kind of, how was the data collected in, in using all right, um, the world is shifting fast. Just to give you a sense of what's happening in Australia, um, there is now a large consortium of organisations, some colleges, state departments of health, academic institutions, industry, trying to start to ask these questions and to see if we can engage with government uh, to, to really start to prepare for what's going on. You have to read through the list of everybody involved. Um, but I think for you, it's important to understand that very much on these issues of safety and quality ethics and also workforce, and that maybe just to move on to workforce. Um, so one of the partners is the Radiology College, which is very engaged with this topic, uh, and they're thinking about how they change training for the radiology training, um, what are the new skill sets and AI enabled the world. Um, they've gone from thinking we're ruined to we're going to take over the world <laughs> in a way because they're already a, a, a tech literate um, population who can reimagine the way they do work. And so, so they're already actively doing that. Um, we'll need to change the way medical students get trained, we'll need to change the way GPs get trained. Some of those skills in that last line are really, you know, a year or more of, of learning when you unpack it. Uh, so I think it's an important discussion even within this college to start to think about, well, you know, Babylon's already in London, it's coming to New Zealand soon, it'll be here, I'm sure within a couple of years. What does that mean for the way that you practice? How comfortable are you about that? Um, and just to finish up about how real is all this, I love Amara's law, which is that um, we overestimate how big technology will be in the short term, but we underestimate long term. So for all those saying the next three to five years are going to be transformational, I don't think so. I think it'll be pretty much as it is now. But in 10 years' time, it will be very different. Um, and so if you're a mid to late career as a physician, 
<laughs> if you're um, if you're uh, in early career, this is going to be hitting you hard mid career. If you are a medical student, what discipline do I even train in? Do I choose to be a radiologist in the future, knowing that it'll be exciting and AI driven, but there'll be ten of them. Um, so so the, so these issues because of the lag in training and workforce. I think you need to be thinking about now. So I kind of think I've said all that really. Um, but it's exciting to also think about um, what might happen. So, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to pick on the radiologists, but they're actually really interesting because they're trying to reimagine what it means to be a radiologist. You know, do I stay in that room that's dark and look at images and, and mutter into a report? Do I change my role? Do I have a patient facing role now, um, you know, beyond interventional? Stuff. Um, do I become not, not an image specialist, but a diagnosis specialist, you know, sort of a house MD kind of thing, um, reinventing uh, their world. So it's very interesting. Um, and the true disruption, I think, will come when technologies merge. So it's not just AI. So the Babylon thing is, is revolutionary, not because the AI is good, but because that model of care stitches lots of different pieces together. Um, imagine what would happen is you've already got your portable ultrasound that you might use in the ED at the bedside. Add AI to that, where it's diagnosing uh, and interpreting. And that changes the role of, of, of um, lots of people, and it changes professions and changes what you can do. That's quite disruptive. Really. So on that optimistic, pessimistic, confused view, um, our fate is to change and roll with it, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Floor up for questions. Yes, go ahead. Enrico, thank you very much. That was so interesting. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I like the way we all giggled when we talked about getting to the latter stages of our career. Like, we're safe, we can sit back. Um, my, my thoughts about that is that for those clinicians who do have a, a vast amount of experience, they can play an enormously important role in terms of education and playing you know, a teaching role for the younger generation and guiding the ethical applications of our art through this field. Absolutely. So, yeah. so it's a mistake to see this as a technological venture. It's technologically enabled, but the business of care is a human business. And so we need to reimagine that human business supported by these technologies. Yeah. And, and you know, the wiser you are and the more experienced you are, the better. Absolutely, yeah. I do believe in computers. They replaced the slide rule and they've, they're much better at me than information retrieval and they're a fantastic communication tool. And ImageNet in about 2007 did transform we did the way we did predictive analytics. And what concerns me is that we're spending millions to billions of dollars on the sexy ideas and not getting the important things right, which is accurate data collection and good data linkages. And it's sabotaged that pathway, which is going to take 10 years to the use of AI, at least in Australia. That's my view, and I don't know whether you think it's... I think you're absolutely right that we are, we are quite late to this discussion. Um, you saw what I talked about in terms of what the UK is doing. What's happening in the US is really mind boggling. Uh, and there, because the drivers are largely commercial, a lot of the data problems are being solved because it's it's worth something now to get the data in good shape. Uh, and so, you know, some of the large HMOs in the US are doing well out of there. They, they, um, so we don't have those drivers here. And that's partly why I don't talk about the alliance because I think Australia is a different case and we're going to have to have to manage it differently. Um, my view is that we won't solve those data problems without an impetus. And I think AI is the driver to make it happen. So um, we've spent 20 years trying to solve it and that we care. But if all of a sudden we're worried about AI, misdiagnosing, and it's available next door, um, all of a sudden we're going to get very serious about it. Let's just say the commercial environment it just saves truckloads of money, and we can't afford not to do it. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so but we're a little bit, you know, we're not really what we do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
thank you for your very insightful presentation. I think tonight was a, a very good um, debate and discussion, and we thank you all for speaking for providing your presentations today. Thank you to also everyone online. Um, I trust you find the information interesting and useful to you all. Uh, we run similar events throughout the year um, through the New South Wales ACT Regional Committee. So please um, keep an eye on, our, on the college's website for any upcoming events. Uh, this session will also um, is worth two CPD points. So we'll send you that information uh, shortly over the next few days. We've also got an evaluation form if you don't have to that out. We love the feedback. It's sort of, you know, we don't look to what events we run in the future. So we really appreciate you attending today. Um, and thank you again to the speakers. We do have a, a small gift if you'd like to come up and collect your gifts. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>